Hi, I'm James Allison. As you can probably imagine, we have had an absolute bag full of questions after the Sakir Grand Prix, and I'm here to answer some of them. For two races running in Bahrain, uh, Valtteri has not had the best of starts. Why was that? It's actually rather different from the first Bahrain Grand Prix to the second, the so-called Sakir Grand Prix. In the first one, uh, he was just a victim of not having good grip available in the grid box where he was situated. So that P2 grid box in that weekend, uh, in the first Grand Prix, just didn't offer good grip. How do we know that? Well, we look across at his teammate at Lewis in that first Grand Prix, and we compare how they dropped the clutch. Both drivers dropped the clutch at the start of the race. Lewis actually dropped his clutch deeper, so with the clutch biting more strongly. So you'd expect, if anything, that Lewis's car would have had more of a tendency to spin the wheels because he dropped the clutch more deeply into the biting point. But Valtteri, despite the fact that that clutch was only lightly engaged, still the wheels lit up and we had wheel spin away from the line, which reduces the rate of acceleration because the actual amount of grip in that position on that day was less than his teammates starting from the pole box. Second Grand Prix, when, uh, when we had Valtteri in the pole slot and George in that unfavored P2 slot, how come then uh, Valtteri had the unlucky poor start and George the lightning quick one? Well, actually both drivers uh, dropped their clutch in the right way. Both got pretty good starts. They both had decent acceleration. And what made the difference was simply that George's reaction time was quicker. George had a very, very quick reaction time on that day, which meant that his car started to move sooner. And although these things only look tiny and fractional at the point where the lights go out, by the time you get to the end of the straight, that fractional advantage has built to quite a big difference, which is what gave him the advantage going around the first corner. A few people have asked us why we left Valtteri out for, for a few laps uh, at that first set of stops around about mid-race distance. Why, having stopped George, did we not bring Valtteri in on the following lap? Instead, uh, we left him out there for four laps before giving him his pit stop in turn. It's a simple answer, really. We, we stopped George first because uh, he was the lead driver and those the, that's the way we go about our racing. Uh, why did we not follow it in the second lap with Valtteri? Well, it was actually to give Valtteri more opportunity. Because in that period, after the lead driver has stopped and the trail driver is still out there on the old tires, although those tires are old and therefore not as quick as the new tires that his teammate is now wearing, there is a big potential advantage if in that window after the first stop of the lead car, there is a safety car. If a safety car were to happen to come out in those laps, then it would give an enormous advantage to the second stopper. Because Valtteri, had a safety car come out, would have been able to get a very cheap stop and therefore catapult himself past George into first place. So we left it as long as we dared, giving Valtteri as many laps possible of this safety car uh, opportunity in case one were to arrive. In the event, it didn't arrive and he wasn't able to capitalize upon that and came out a few laps after to George on rubber that was fresh and with fewer laps to put on it than, than George would. And as a consequence, he was then uh, able to start eating back into the, the gap between the two cars in the subsequent laps. If you'd watched the race, you would have heard uh, George complaining about loss of power at various stages. We were suffering from some gremlins in our PU on George's car. What were these? Well, on the lap, I think it was on the lap to the grid, we, we saw that one of the sensors in the exhaust system of the car started to suffer some, some misbehavior. And that misbehavior meant that it just wasn't giving the sort of uh, consistent signal that we require in order for the normal operation of the power unit. And this erroneous sensor value was starting to make the power fluctuate. Now, normally when we have these sensors start to misbehave, 
the way that we deal with it is that we tell the car, just stop paying attention to that sensor, please. It's not reliable and, uh, and use a backup strategy instead. The backup strategy will not be as powerful as the main strategy that is based around a healthy sensor, but it will be a lot better than if it, if it tries to base its input on this dodgy sensor. Quite early on in the race, we told George to effectively switch off that sensor, to tell the car, ignore what that sensor is telling me, and then the car would use this backup mode instead. And so that's, that's what we did quite early on in the race. Now, the problem was that the action that we had got prepared for being able to turn that sensor off and ignore it, annoyingly, it also had the effect of making the car ignore another sensor. Now, it shouldn't have done that. It should have only ignored the one we were interested in, in ignoring. And by effectively ignoring both of these sensors, we bought ourselves another problem. And that other problem was that the second sensor that was being ignored is one that the FIA is interested in because it's one of the sensors they use to monitor the legality of the car, specifically how much electrical energy are you discharging in any given lap. And so the FAA could understand what had happened, but clearly they would much prefer it if this, uh, this second sensor was still online and still doing its business as it should do. Now, a little bit later on in the race, the first sensor, the one that had caused us the problem, stopped being just dodgy and looked like it had died a natural death all on its own. And at that point, we don't any longer need to tell the car to ignore it because it's actually dead dead rather than sort of on a bit, off a bit. So it was in our interest to switch the system back to normal so that the second of these two sensors, the one that the FIA want to look at, comes back online as well. So we did that. And then for a while, the car was basically behaving okay. It was not relying on the dead sensor, it was working in a backup mode, and the second of these two sensors was giving the stream that the FIA want to see for monitoring the electrical discharges. But then, and this was probably the radio message that was sort of most obvious to the people watching the race, but then at a certain point in the race, after the pit stop, the, the sensor that had died, or we thought had died, had a little bit of a sort of, um, a, a sort of Lazarus moment and came back from the dead. Uh, and at that point, it started to make the power fluctuate again, and it needed to be turned off a second time, bringing back the other issue with the, uh, with the second sensor that we'd had at the beginning of the race. All of this was just a, an enormous sort of pain in the neck for the guys in the, in the garage to manage, and also for George to manage, a, a hassle and a worry uh, that involved him having to do a bunch of steering wheel switchery to try to get the car in a position where the PU could run happily with the, uh, with the mixture of sensors that, uh, that were left and functioning correctly uh, by, by later in the race. Didn't actually cause us much lost time, didn't actually cause us much lost power, but it was a nuisance and a worry uh, handled rather well by a guy driving our car for the first time that weekend. With our cars in such a commanding position in the race and with us clearly being the quickest cars out there, why was it that at the safety car bought out by the Aitken incident, why did we feel the need to do a pit stop at all? And indeed, why did we double stack the cars well, the reason we chose to do it is that Sakir has a very rough surface to the asphalt. That rough surface, it eats away at the tires and makes them go slower with each passing lap. And after you've done a handful of laps, the tires are in much worse state than they are when they're brand new. And although we were, like for like, the quickest car on the track, so if we were on the same age tires as everybody else, we were definitely the quickest car out there. By the time we would be on very worn tires and maybe some competitors behind us on, on brand new tires, if they chose to make a pit stop behind the safety car, then the, the, the competitiveness of our car would not look so shiny. We were well in the lead. We had not just a safety car worth of gap between us and and the car in third place. We had a whole pit stops worth of free space behind us. And so there was a lot of time for us to come in and do a very relaxed pit stop with our first car and our second car on the same lap. Even though we had to make the call quite late 
because when the safety car came out, we were not very far from the entrance to the pits. There was a lot of time to get that pit stop executed, get safely back out onto the track, and then be on fresh tires for the remainder of the race and completely protected by any risk that we would be on old tires with marauding competitors behind us on fresh rubber. Given the position in the race that we're in, the decision to stop was not a controversial one. That was something we would do again uh, if, if faced with the same choices and it's something we would do in the future at any other track in similar circumstances. That wasn't a bad decision. Of course, when we then failed to execute that double stack correctly, everything falls apart and it looks like a terrible mess, a sort of key, keystone cop moments where all of our normal well-oiled machinery just falls apart and we start looking like clowns instead. What caused that? Well, that was actually caused by one very simple thing. And it's a simple thing that could have got us at any point in the last several years because that bug, that mistake in the way we'd set things up has been sitting there as a gotcha waiting to get us. And this weekend, I'm afraid it did get us. What was that? I think you have to start by understanding that the radios that the pit crew use can only hear one voice at a time. Although they're listening to more than one potential input source, they can only hear one input source at a time. They're not like a teleconference where you can have several people speaking at once. One channel is all they can hear. And they are normally listening to their boss on the pit wall, Ron Meadows, who will tell them when they need to come out into the pit lane in order to do a tire stop. But their radios are not just tuned in to Ron Meadows. They're also tuned in or they're scanning to listen to the driver. So on George's side of the garage, his mechanics have their radios scanning, listening out for the driver. If the driver is gonna pipe up and say something, their radios will latch on to what the driver is saying and Valtteri's side will do the same for Valtteri's voice. Right at the point where Ron was calling to the pit crew to do the double stack, exactly at that moment, uh, George was also speaking on the radio. And for half of the people on George's side of the garage, their radios, instead of hearing what Ron was saying, the radio had latched on to what George was saying instead. And so half of the guys on George's side of the garage did not hear the message. And that meant that when everyone came out into the pit lane to execute the stops, only half of George's tires arrived. And, uh, and that meant that when George actually showed up in the pit lane to get his stop done, uh, the tires that were sitting there were half his and half Valtteri's because the full set of Valtteri's tires did arrive. And without realizing it, that first stop the mechanics fitted a mixed set. They, fixed, they fit, fitted to the car half of the set of George's tires correctly, and then uh, they fitted what was there, which was, which was Valtteri's tires. So at that point, uh, George left the pit lane with a mixed set of tires. Valtteri immediately behind pulled into the pit box. By then we'd realized we'd screwed up. Couldn't do anything at that stage about George. That problem was sailed. However, there was a, a, a moment where we'd realized we'd screwed up and all that key, keystone cop moment that you saw, that was the team scrambling around actually very effectively to try to undo the mess that we'd created with that one uh, mistake of having the radios programmed in this way that caused the confusion to start with. So it caused a lot of lost time as we then scrambled the tires uh, round to get a, a valid set onto Valtteri's car, remembering, of course, that half of Valtteri's tires had left with George, and so we had to scramble a completely different set onto Valtteri's car, and in fact, the quickest and best way out was to actually refit the original tires that Valtteri had arrived with, and then send him off on what, what weren't good tires for him to be on, but it was the best, was the least worst option at that stage. So one tiny mistake, programming the radios in a way that they could override hearing this really important call from Ronnie Meadows on the pit wall is what caused all that mess. We're just lucky, of course, that this happened now 
after a championship was settled, or maybe not in next season when everything was live and really counting uh, in the middle of a championship fight. But it was nevertheless very painful, very embarrassing, and really, really hard rations for both uh, George and for Valtteri to have to swallow uh, the consequences of that when they'd driven so well up to that point. Having had the tyre mix up at the safety car stop and then having suffered a tyre change to rectify that to take the mixed set off and put his own correct tyres on the car, having suffered all that, George was still out there in the hunt for the win. He'd managed to get himself up into second place and was hounding down the racing point and had a chance to overhaul it before the end of the race. But at that point, we noticed that he'd picked up a puncture on his rear tire. It was a slow puncture, thankfully, and not one that destroyed the tire and then the car, as you've seen so often in the past, when, when these tires let go. It, but it did let us get back round to the pits and change the tires. What caused this slow puncture? Well, we don't know for sure. All we can tell you is that there was debris on the track as a result of Aitken's crash. Maybe he picked up a small shard of carbon splinter from that incident. And we also know that in getting past all the people that he was overtaking, he was having to take some fairly aggressive lines over curbs uh, in order to muscle his way by. And it's possible that either from the, the debris of Aitken's uh, uh, incident or from, from from uh, the curb riding he was doing that he picked up a cut that caused the puncture. We don't know for sure. All we know is that the puncture happened and that he took another blow in what had been a magnificent race for him to that point. And, uh, and that put, put paid to, to his hopes of that maiden victory. It was a shock when we learned seven days ago that Lewis had tested positive for COVID and that that would deny him the opportunity to be in our car at the Sakir Grand Prix. It would deny him too his chance to exceed his own personal tally of number of wins in a single season and perhaps to equal Michael's record of 13 despite it only being a 17 race season. And we missed him all weekend but it is undeniable that we were also very excited about the prospect of seeing how George would get on. George has had a very impressive career in all the formulae that he's raced in so far. And none of us are in any doubt that he's a fast driver. But the question was actually, how well would he stand up to the pressure? How would he handle himself under the spotlight of the world when given the chance to run in a leading car for the first time in Formula One? And how would he stand up to that pressure when he was thrown right into the cauldron of it with such short notice, having to take on board so much information in such a short period of time. And I think we can say uh, with absolute confidence that he answered that question uh, in every respect very, very strongly. He set himself off in free practice gently, but quickly worked himself up to a good pace. Although Valtteri was just a shade quicker than him uh, throughout the weekend, uh, and crucially in qualifying, what we saw in George was that as the pressure came on, he didn't wilt, and actually through every session, he improved. And for someone the very first time in the car, up against a peddler who is as quick as Valtteri, he showed a very, very good performance. And I think that that is the main takeaway for us, is that that question of how he would comport himself has been answered very, very strongly. In the pressure of qualifying, he was absolutely on the money. On the race start, he did a fantastic job. In the race itself, when he was called upon to overtake in an incisive manner, he did so brilliantly. These are all really, really important assets for a front-running driver. And I think George, despite the disappointment of the result, can go home knowing that he showed the world what he's made of. Thank you very much for all your questions and we'll be back after the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix to answer some more.